Good afternoon. <clears throat> Not surprisingly, we're starting on time. <laughs> My name is Billy Weitzer. I'm the executive director of the Leo Beck Institute. And I want to welcome everyone to the 58th annual Leo Beck Memorial Lecture. As you must also know by now, this is the 60th anniversary of the Leo Beck Institute. Um, I can't imagine what the uh, emigre intellectuals who founded the Institute in 1955 would have thought we would be like 60 years later. Whether they would have imagined that we have 3.5 million documents, nearly all of which have been digitized. We have a book collection of 80,000 titles. We have 8,000 individual artifacts and works of art. Plus, we're in the Center for Jewish History here with four other partners and the center administration to, and without which we would not have this beautiful facility. But I also think they'd be very pleased to know that our mission has remained the same, to preserve and promote the history and culture of German-speaking Jewry. And in Michael Brenner and Michael Meyer, we have two individuals who have done a great, great deal to preserve and promote that history. Before I introduce Michael Brenner and Michael Meyer, I want to acknowledge our president, Dr. Ronald Sobel, who will come up later this afternoon. And also, he'll come with Ms. Joan Lessing, a longtime board member and member of our honors committee. <clears throat> Joan is also the daughter of Fred Lessing, who was president of LBI from 1960 to 1990, and is responsible for much of what LBI is today. Appropriately, our archives are named the Frederick W. Lessing Memorial Archives. I'd also like to acknowledge Consul General Britta Wagner, who's here, and also from the consulate, Mario Zauder, and also like to thank Joel Levy, the president of the Center for Jewish History, for being here. We also have many board members here, Bob Rifkin, Abe Lowenthal, Nicole Kubin, Amy Houston, Henry Feingold, Lee Sander, David Detchen, and if I missed anyone, I'm sorry, but I think I got them all. And I want to thank each and every one of you who serve on the board for the many contributions that you make to the Leo Beck Institute, and thank you for coming tonight. <clears throat> we also have staff who have supported this event, and I thank them, and especially Carol Constraus, our international director, and Frank Mecklenburg, our research director. Professor Michael Brennan's credentials are in your program, so I won't repeat, repeat them. But as noted, Michael's scholarly contributions to German Jewish history are significant, including his collaboration with Michael Meyer on the four-volume survey of German Jewish history in modern times. But I also want to point out that Michael's role as LBI International President, as a colleague, as an advisor, and a friend are equally important to me personally and to the success of the Leo Beck Institute. The order of the program will be that Michael Brenner will introduce Michael Meyer. Michael will give a speech. Um, he will not be answering questions in the group, but we will have a reception afterwards where you can talk with Michael. And then, as I said, Dr. Sobel and Ms. Lessing will come up at the end of the program. So let's begin. Thank you. Thank you, Billy, for this warm introduction, and thank you for having me here. It is a true honor to introduce Michael Meyer on the occasion of his presentation of this year's Leo Beck Memorial Lecture. An internationally renowned scholar, an educator of generations of rabbis, a mentor to many of us here, and the long-term president of LBI International, Michael Meyer hardly needs an introduction at this very place. So let me start with a history that not everybody in this room might know, and it goes a little bit further back, reaches back before Michael's birth. You might have heard of the ritual murder accusation that took place in a town called Konitz in Western Prussia in the year 1900. 
Many historians, most notably Martin Walzer Smith, have written about it in recent years. Well, some of the key events took place in a hardware store in Konitz owned by a certain Mateus Meyer. And this Mateus Meyer happened to be the great grandfather of our speaker today. It was this horrible accusation and the violence that came with it that caused the Meyer family to leave Konitz and settle in Berlin. Here he raised Michael Meyer's grandfather who became a physician. Here Michael's parents lived their early years in the exciting atmosphere of the Weimar Republic. And here Michael was born in 1937. The family then left Germany literally in the last minute in the summer of 1941 after an adventurous journey to the United States. Michael Meyer is not only the chronicler of German Jewry, his own family history is intricately intertwined with the ups and downs of German Jewish history of the last century. He grew up in Los Angeles, but within a world of German Jews, and I think for many of us, he embodies the world of German Jews. Actually, I, sorry, Michael, I have to say that. When Billy just said, we're starting on time, he looked at his watch and said, more or less. <laughs> After receiving his B and I'll tell. After receiving his BA from UCLA, he went on to earn a doctorate at Hebrew Union College at Cincinnati, where he started teaching in 1967 and where he retired recently. Although quite a few other places extended offers to Michael, he remained faithful to Hebrew Union College, where he had a teaching career that spanned almost half a century. He also taught regularly at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Of course, in Israel, he taught in Hebrew, and he also was a fellow at the Abi Warburg House in Hamburg and lectures often in Germany. And of course, when he is in Germany, he lectures in German. Michael Meyer served as one of the first presidents of the Association of Jewish Studies, which he helped to establish. And from 2003 to 2006, he chaired the Academic Advisory Council of the Center for Jewish History. In 1996, Professor Meyer won the National Foundation for Jewish Culture Scholarship Award in historical studies for major influence on colleagues and students in his field. In 1997, he was a fellow at the Institute for Advanced Studies of the Hebrew University in Jerusalem and in 2001, he received an honorary doctor of Hebrew letters degree from the Jewish Theological Seminary. In 2008, Jewish historians from the United States, Israel, and Europe honored him with the Jubilee volume. Professor Meyer's book have won three Jewish book awards, and they include classics such as The Origins of the Modern Jew, Response to Modernity, A History of the Reform Movement, and Jewish identity in the modern world. Among the books he has edited, let me mention the four volume German Jewish history in modern times, as I've been quite closely involved with that. And I think one of my, the, 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 the experiences that shaped my, me myself as a historian most is the almost weekly visits over about a year when I taught at Bloomington, Indiana, I went to Cincinnati every, almost every weekend or every second weekend. And something I learned is not just to read a text and go and look up every footnote, which of course Michael Meyer would do. He would check every footnote of every person, every author in this volume, but he insisted that he, we would sit together and read loud every single word of every part of these four volumes to each other. And I must say, we caught so many little mistakes, little things. I, I, I think I really learned what meticulous editing and scholarly working meant by working so intensively with Michael, um, well, over 20 years ago by now. 
Michael Meyer is, I would say, legendary as a thorough and fast reader of almost any written product sent to him as long as it interests him. How often have I heard recently graduated doctoral students say, well, my advisor was professor and then came some famous name from an Ivy League university, but the person who really read my manuscript most carefully was Michael Meyer. Although he taught his whole life at a rabbinical seminary, he's not a rabbi. He is what his license plate said for a while, a rabbit's, as his wife Margie is the rabbi in the family. I'd like to welcome Margie Meyer. Uh, and she's not the only rabbi in the family. Uh, there is also his son Daniel and his son-in-law Ken. Ladies and gentlemen, let me remind me, let me remind you that there are two facts concerning the Leo Back Memorial Lecture which might be worth mentioning. It is only appropriate, I think, that the very first lecture in 1958 was delivered by Michael Meyer's teacher, Fritz Bamberger. And let me also say that Michael Meyer himself already delivered the 25th Leo Back Memorial Lecture in 1981. And in fact, no one before Michael Meyer has ever been invited to deliver the Leo Beck Memorial Lecture more than once. There is only one reason for this exception. No one is better suited than Michael Meyer to give the Leo Beck Memorial Lecture on the occasion of the Institute's 60th anniversary. Michael Meyer has embodied the Leo Beck Institute and the preservation of the German Jewish cultural heritage. It is my privilege to welcome Professor Meyer. Thank you, Michael Brenner, for that most generous introduction. Since you said so much about my person, let me begin with a personal word, if I may. For more than half a century, my life has really been bound up with the Leo Beck Institute. It has been for me not only an indispensable resource for my work, as it is for so many people, but it has also been part of the path to my own self-discovery as a German Jew who came here as a small child and grew up in the United States. But if the relationship has been more than academic, that has been due as well on account of my immense respect for the man whose name this institute carries. Sadly, I never had the honor of getting to know Leo Beck personally, but his aura has guided me since I first learned of his heroic, rational, indomitable faith. As has often been noted, after the Holocaust, Leo Beck became the symbol of the admirable qualities that mark German Jewry. The dignity, the learning, the spiritual resistance to evil. Many institutions have been named after him, but it is this one the Leo Beck Institute, of which he briefly served as international president before his death in 1956, that was perhaps closest to his heart. It is an honor to speak of this institute as it reaches the age of 60 years, and through its particular history, also of the larger history of German Jewry itself. 
almost 53 years ago. On November 7, 1962, I traveled to the Leo Beck Institute, then located in a beautiful, dignified building on 129 East 73rd Street to attend a lecture, a lecture by Professor Erich Kahler, a member of Princeton's Institute for Advanced Study, a famed philosopher and literary scholar born to a prominent Jewish family in Prague. He had once been Erich von Kahler, a designation he chose to give up in America. Like so many Jewish immigrants from German-speaking Europe, Kahler had gravitated to the Leo Beck Institute, which made him a fellow, and when he died, he bequeathed a large part of his literary estate to the LBI archives. That very year, the international LBI published Kahler's Die Philosophie von Hermann Broch, a study of the major Austrian Jewish literary modernist, as the ninth publication in its scholarly series, the Schriftenreihe Wissenschaftlicher Abhandlungen des Leo Beck Institutes, a series that today counts close to 80 volumes. In 1962, I was a graduate student, nervously trying to get a grasp on the German Jewish essence so that I could convey some element of it in my doctoral dissertation. I therefore listened closely to what the lecturer had to say. Kahler spoke of what he called a psychic interpenetration between Germanism and Judaism. He claimed to show certain similarities between Jews and Germans. The Jews, a people without a country, a particular people, and yet one that conveyed a universal religion along with a broad love of the cosmopolitan. The Germans, a people that never succeeded in becoming fully united, who for many centuries lived their history within the larger Holy Roman Empire, and both then and thereafter, continually searched, searched desperately for their own particular national spirit. The Germans excelled both at philo-Semitism, witness Gotthold Ephraim Lessing, Moses Mendelssohn's close friend, and at anti-Semitism, witness National Socialism. The Jews were attracted to the German speculative soul, but shunned the other half, what Kahler called the body. Nazism, the lecturer concluded, was the revolt of the body. From its beginnings, 60 years ago, the Leo Beck Institute for the History and Culture of German-Speaking Jewry, to give it its complete title, has been probing the nature of that interpenetration of which Kahler spoke. Through 60 yearbooks, its variegated monographs, its conferences in America, in Europe, and Israel, its manifold lectures and symposia, in its library, archives, and art collection here in New York, it has stored up the evidence that makes possible an interpretation, or I should say, a variety of interpretations of the German Jewish experience. It has been active as well in Israel, in Great Britain, and in the Federal Republic of Germany. Now, after two generations, and beyond the material accomplishments, 
What has the LDI and those associated with it achieved in the quest to understand the exquisitely complex phenomenon we call German Jewry? We gather today, one day in advance of the 77th anniversary of the November pogrom of 1938. Since 1945, often called Kristallnacht, the night of crystal, on account of the broken glass from thousands of vandalized Jewish shops, their shattered windows littering the streets, the detritus of destruction. That pogrom marked an end point. When it was over, there was no longer a Jewish community that was even semi-independent, and Rabbi Leo Beck could do no more than bravely attempt to sustain morale, to save whomever could be saved as German Jewry rapidly sank ever deeper into oblivion. The Holocaust was at the gate. It has, however, never been the purpose of the Leo Beck Institute to chronicle the destruction of German Jewry. That task was not in the minds of the founders 60 years ago, nor of those who followed them. Other institutions here in America and in Israel have made the catastrophe of European Jewry the subject of recollection and research. We have chosen, instead, to look back to the years before Nazism and, more recently, also those that followed after it. And we have studiously avoided viewing German Jewish history through the lens of the Holocaust, choosing, instead, to strive for an empathetic understanding of pre-Holocaust Jewish existence in its own time and not with the hindsight of our time. When the Council of Jews from Germany, under the impetus of leading German Jewish intellectuals then living in Israel, founded the LBI in 1955, a charter was promulgated which specified that it was not to be a mere purveyor of nostalgia, simply recounting the triumphs and achievements of former generations. Instead, it was to be devoted to impartial scholarship, letting the chips fall where they may. But at the same time, and in the first instance, it was to serve the personal needs of the refugee community, to strengthen its historical memory, lest the scattered remnants of German Jewry be forced to begin anew not only their practical lives, but also their spiritual and cultural existence in the lands of the German Jewish diaspora. The relevant passage from the Charter reads, and I quote, We want to give a faithful presentation, free from apologetic or tendentious coloring of all that the Jews living in German-speaking countries have done and felt, thought and created, where they prove themselves and where they failed. We want to show the historic role of the community in which we have our common roots wherever we may live today." End quote. That founding generation, which sought to preserve its history, has since itself passed into history. Our account of the deep wounds 
on account of the deep wounds it had suffered, loss of close relatives, exiles from the landscape of their childhood, its relationship to post-war Germany for a long time as a result remained deeply ambivalent. On the one hand, it wanted to pay tribute to pre-Nazi Germany, but only with difficulty could it imagine that the Federal Republic might be able to transcend the ex execrable heritage of the recent past and be able to bind itself to that earlier legacy. Our founders regarded themselves, the refugees and exiles, as the self-designated stewards of German Jewish tradition and believed that the proper locations for that stewardship did not include Germany itself. It was only after much soul searching that in 1985, the LBI for the first time initiated an international conference in Germany. The topic that was carefully chosen, however, bore a whiff of defiance. It focused upon the 1930s, but not on the Nuremberg Laws or other Nazi measures of discrimination. Rather, its lectures were devoted to how Jewish organizational and spiritual life had been sustained in the face of persecution, what we now term the spiritual resistance of German Jewry. Those associated with the LBI today have no personal experience of the Weimar or the first Austrian republics, and very few suffered as adults during the Nazi years. They may or may not stem from German Jewish families. They may or may not be Jewish. Their knowledge of the subject may have come in part from a story told by a parent or a grandparent, but more fundamentally, their conclusions are the result of scholarly research. Whereas few of the early writers in the Leo Beck Institute yearbook were trained historians, today's LBI scholars regard themselves as members of the historical or of an allied academic profession. They have sought to bring the study of the German Jewish past into the purview of contemporary scholarship. The historical works that have been written on German-speaking Jewry, many of them under the umbrella of the LBI, have been of different kinds, depending upon the interest of the particular scholar, and in some cases, of topics that stood at the top of a broader scholarly agenda. I should like now to suggest some categories into which I believe they fall. Those writings that have reached the widest readership have focused on the great names, the individuals who enjoyed the broadest familiarity and in whom there was the greatest interest. The philosopher Moses Mendelssohn, the poet Heinrich Heine, the artist Max Lieberman, the scientist Albert Einstein, the psychoanalyst Sigmund Freud, the enigmatic writer Franz Kafka, the high-ranking politician Walter Rottenau, and others like them. Frequently, these works ask why it was that so many German Jews, so out of all proportion to their numbers, were awarded a Nobel Prize. In this context, Jews by conviction tend to appear 
alongside Jews who converted to Christianity and individuals with questionable Jewish attachments or with very little of any Jewish influence on their work are not sidelined on that account. Karl Marx, who was converted to Christianity in childhood, for example, may receive more attention than such principal figures of Jewish religious reform in Germany as Zacharias Frankel and Abraham Geiger. The composer Felix Mendelssohn, though a devout Christian, nonetheless receives due attention. Eager to avoid even a smudge of parochialism, these works show little interest in the inner history of the Jewish community, in its religious life, community organization, and in Jewish education. I would term these, term, these histories of famous Jews using a German term, Spitzengeschichte, a history especially of those individuals who made it to the top, who managed in large measure to transcend Jewish origins and find their place within the larger cultural history of modern times. One example of this approach, perhaps the most familiar to us, would be the immensely popular The Pity of It All by Amos Elon, which appeared in 2002. For Elon, it is the Jewish attachment to Bildung, that unique combination of character and culture acquired from its German milieu which most accurately defines German Jewry. A second example would be the permanent exhibit of the Jewish Museum in Berlin, where modern, whose modern section centers upon the assimilated Jew, not the observant one. LBI scholarship, I would say, has been relatively more focused on the Jewish within the German Jewish identity. Given the Holocaust, it is not surprising that another sort of German Jewish history has focused on anti-Semitism in the attempt to explain why so educated and cultured a nation could descend into such brutality. Was Jew hatred deeply rooted in the German character from earliest times? Or was Nazism more a product of its own age than of the German past? Almost 20 years ago, David Jonah Goldhagen proposed the theory that what he called eliminationist anti-Semitism was uniquely rooted in German history from medieval times and easily morphed into exterminationist anti-Semitism. But this volume, more of a lawyer's brief than an historical work of objectivity, neglected to deal adequately with the complexity of the phenomenon, with its appearance outside of Germany, and with how, if it was indeed so pervasive, by the time of the Weimar Republic, mixed marriages of Jews and Christians had become so common. Of course, the LBI could not neglect this subject. To have done so would have distorted the German Jewish experience. But the scholarship done under its auspices has been far more nuanced than Goldhagen's blockbuster work. To give what may be the most influential example, in the Leo Beck Institute yearbook for 1978, Professor Shulamit Volkov of Tel Aviv University published an article entitled Antisemitism as a Cultural Code, Reflections on the History 
and historiography of anti-Semitism in imperial Germany. For Volkov, there was not a single anti-Semitism, but various forms of it in different segments of the populace. Mildest, but perhaps in the end most pernicious since it manifested itself in the most influential circles was the tendency to use it as a cultural code, a sign of belonging to a specific cultural camp that had no room for Jews. As a cultural code, anti-Semitism played a specific and symbolic role in German society. Though not itself espousing violence, it made that society more susceptible to the crude radau antisemitismus, the violent variety shouted by the brown-shirted rowdies marching on German streets in the 1930s. An older form of German Jewish history pursued by the Beck Institute, we may term the history of emancipation. Unlike France, where Jewish equality came quickly with the French Revolution, and Russia, where there was no hope for it in the 19th century, a divided Germany provided Jewish emancipation piecemeal at a different pace in one German state than in another. Jews were not to be given equality as a natural right, but were expected to earn it by shaving away their particularities so that they could slip noiselessly into German society. The processes leading to emancipation varied, not so much on account of ideological differences with regard to the proper place of Jews, as principally on account of tangible developments such as demographic and economic shifts, and also in step with the political successes of liberal factions. Writers still focus on the popular champion of Jewish political emancipation, Gabriel Reeser. But for all of Reeser's eloquence, for all of his insistence that German ideals required the establishment of political equality, what ultimately made the difference was not Jewish advocacy, but circumstances over which Jews had relatively little control. Although many scholars associated with the LBI have concentrated on this topic of Jewish emancipation, I would call particular attention to the insightful analyses provided by Professor Reinhard Rurup, for many years professor at the Technische Universität in Berlin and the first prominent non-Jew to play a central role in the LBI as the founding chair of its Wissenschaftliche Arbeitsgemeinschaft, the LBI's Association of Scholars in Germany. It was Rurup's careful source-based study of the emancipation process entitled, quote, Jewish Emancipation and Bourgeois Society, which appeared in the yearbook in 1969 that set an example for later work on this subject. In the early years of the LBI, a large portion, perhaps the largest portion of its research was devoted to what the Germans call Geistesgeschichte, roughly a combination of intellectual and cultural history. One begins with Moses Mendelssohn and goes on to discuss other Jews who played important roles in German philosophy and literary culture. Of course, Heinrich Heine, too, looms, Heinrich Heine looms large here, but also Berthold Auerbach, Alfred Döblin, Nellie Sachs, and many others. 
Among the philosophers, the LBI has paid special attention to the most significant individuals whose thought was influential beyond Jewish circles, such as the neo-Kantian Hermann Cohen and the perennially popular Martin Buber. Closely allied to Jewish Geistesgeschichte is Jewish Religionsgeschichte, the history of the Jewish religion. Here, too, the LBI has played a very large role. As has been so often pointed out, modern Judaism as we know it today in America and elsewhere emerged in its varieties in Germany during the 19th century. There, the influence of modern thought, aesthetic taste, and the desire for political integration inscribing themselves into Jewish theology and practice created a spectrum running from neo-orthodoxy of Samson Raphael Hirsch to the radical reform of Samuel Holtheim. Rabbi Leo Beck represented the religious mainstream in Germany, the liberal faction that respected tradition and Jewish unity, but unlike Rabbi Hirsch, also recognized that Judaism dwelt within history and not above it. In its approach to Jewish religious texts, German Jewry, unlike other Jewish communities, was not drawn to Jewish mysticism, at least not until the 20th century, and even then scarcely beyond a fascination with Martin Buber's renderings of Hasidic stories. What characterized the German-Jewish relationship to Jewish texts was not the search for secret meanings, but rather a more secular than pietistic approach, though religious motivation was not entirely lacking. It was the university and its critical approach to the past, not the yeshiva, that attracted young Jewish intellectuals at the beginning of the 19th century. Their academic studies led them to believe that only if, as within the university setting, Jews could treat their heritage in the manner that Christian scholars treated theirs, would Judaism remain viable within the dominant intellectual milieu. Thus, yet another major contribution to Jewish modernity came into existence, the Wissenschaft des Judentums, the scholarly study of Jews and Judaism, which the longtime president of the New York LBI, Professor Ismar Schorsch, has investigated in enlightening detail, showing how traditional texts were henceforth explored, not alone for their content, but also within their historical context. The broad world of academic Jewish scholarship today rests upon the pioneering work of Leopold Suntz and his associates and successors. A no less significant legacy of German Jewry than the modernization of the Jewish religion, which was indeed so closely associated with it. And of course, the Leo Beck Institute in its research on German Jewry is heir to the aspiration of attaining maximum objectivity in historical writing. One might say that in studying the history of Wissenschaft des Judentums, the LBI is both the investigator and the inheritor of its mode of research. By the 1970s, however, a major shift in emphasis was taking place. Intellectual history and biographies of influential figures were now increasingly regarded as representing too narrow a view of the past. 
more emphasis needed to be given to impersonal social forces and to non-political social groupings like the family. In books and in articles, some of them in the Leo Beck Institute yearbook, Professor Marion Kaplan has done pioneering work in exploring such issues as, for example, marriage strategies of Jews in Imperial Germany. She and others have made the gender dimension a sine qua non for any study of German Jewry that lays claim to breadth of analysis. Thus, the history of German Jewish women came to occupy an ever larger role within the scholarly agenda of German Jewish scholarship. This attention to families, to women's roles, but also more broadly to day-to-day -day activities of average people had earlier prompted the New York LBI, beginning as early as 1976, to publish a three-volume selection of the numerous memoirs, mostly by average German Jews, gathered in its archives in previous years. Professor Monica Richards, a leading historian, came across the ocean from Germany and spent many months choosing the memoirs of greatest interest and providing important introductions and notes. A generation later, the LBI would undertake a project that would turn memoirs and other archival materials into a presentation of that aspect of German Jewish history known in German as Alltagsgeschichte. Initiated by the LBI, edited by Marian Kaplan, and published in English, German, and Hebrew, it appeared in 2005, entitled Jewish Daily Life in Germany, 1618 to 1945. From its earliest days, the Leo Beck Institute had set as its ultimate goal the publication of a synthetic, broadly encompassing history of the entire range of experience of Jews in German-speaking lands, what the Germans call a Gesamtgeschichte. An early attempt to achieve this goal did not come to fruition. It was not until the late 1980s that the editorial process which could produce a four-volume German-Jewish history in modern times was set in motion. It was to include the big names, but also the experience of the common people and the work of the Jewish communities, the accomplishments, but also the shortcomings, the outer history of acceptance and rejection, as well as the inner history of religious and cultural productivity. Its 10 authors came from Israel, Germany, the United Kingdom, and the United States. I had the burden and honor of integrating the work of this distinguished but fiercely independent group, aiming at a flowing, coherent, yet balanced and scientifically respectable work. In this, I was immeasurably aided by my successor as international president of the LBI, Professor Michael Brenner. Although the LBI had thus undertaken a comprehensive history of German Jewry, its participants had decided that the narrative beginning with the Middle Ages would end with the Holocaust. The post-war German Jewish communities in the Federal Republic in the West and the Socialist German Democratic Republic in the East were then regarded as a separate phenomenon too far removed from pre-war German Jewish traditions to be part of the same narrative. The four volumes provided only a brief epilogue called the German Jewish Diaspora. However, in the course of time as the contemporary German Jewish community grew and matured, 
as scholars began to examine the history of the displaced persons camps, the new community structure, the immigrants from Russia and Israel, and the prominent figures who had returned to Germany, the LBI could no longer exclude this subject from its historical purview. The rapidly developing communal intellectual and spiritual life required an expansion beyond the initially designated period from the 18th century Jewish Enlightenment to the eve of the Holocaust. The LBI had already extended its chronological starting point, now giving attention in the yearbook to early modern and even medieval German Jewry. Responding to the new community on the old soil, the LBI this last decade, under the editorship of Michael Brenner, published a history of the Jews in Germany from 1945 all the way down to the present time. This scholarly interest in the post-war community coincided with a sharper focus on the work on on the work on German Jewry being produced within Germany itself, a trend to which the LBI here in New York responded by the creation of a branch of its archives within Berlin's Jewish Museum and the arrangement of a number of cultural and social events in the German capital. Throughout the 60-year history of the Leo Beck Institute, the question of the relation between German Jews and non-Jewish Germans raised by Erich Kahler has remained a central issue. Was it a productive relationship, a fruitful symbiosis, as many have claimed, a mutual fructification that resulted in amazing cultural productivity, or was it rather as Gershom Scholem famously insisted, an unrequited love that German Jews had pressed upon their fellow Germans. Does the history of German Jewry for contemporary Jews, wherever they may live, point to a heritage worthy of admiration, or rather one that calls for caution? It seems to me that this question rests upon an inadequate premise. It assumes that Germans and Jews represent two clearly distinguishable entities that interacted with each other during the course of a shared history. No doubt before the incremental process of Jewish cultural integration began, in the 18th century, that distinction held. Jews lived within their own sphere, not only religiously, but also linguistically and culturally as well. Few Jews had extensive contact with Christian Germans outside the commercial relations that they had with one another. But over the course of the following century, the all-encompassing Jewish identity contracted to make room for broader cultural identifications. The Jew living in German lands gradually morphed into the German Jew, whose Jewishness was increasingly defined, if not solely, at least dominantly, by his or her religion. But it was not entirely a one-way process. Even as the German Jew absorbed Goethe and Schiller and fell in love with Beethoven and Mozart, so, if more gradually, at least some German non-Jews began to absorb characteristics that were widely regarded as Jewish. They read Jewish writers, purchased the works of Jewish artists, sought amusement from the barbs of Jewish satirists. Jewish self-critique and Jewish irony spread through the press, especially in the larger cities. 
By the end of the 19th century, Jew and German were no longer the clearly separate cultural categories that they had been before the beginning of Jewish integration. Of course, the composition varied in different segments of the Jewish and non-Jewish populations. And clearly, Jews took in more Germanness than non-Jews took in Jewishness. Nonetheless, in 1880, the Jewish parliamentarian, Ludwig Bamberger, could remark, quote, to no other people have the Jews grown so close, haben sich so zusammengelebt, as they have with the Germans. And somewhat later, the Jewish philosopher Hermann Cohen could equate, could equate Deutschtum and Judentum as possessing a common social and intellectual ideal. That the word Deutschtum, Germanism, thus lost some of its distinctiveness is evidenced by the fact that racist German writers often discarded it in favor of the more exclusive term Germanentum, whereas Jews could claim the former to be Deutsche, no amount of integration could give them access to the latter Germanen. Thus it seems that in our contemporary examination of the German Jewish experience, we need to understand German Jewish identity as a dynamic category which manifested itself in multiple ways, differentially over time and differentially in various segments of the Jewish population, widely ranging religiously from orthodox to atheist and ethnically from negation of any Jewish ethnic attachment via a semi-ethnic attachment widely called Stammbewusstsein, a strong awareness of personal Jewish origins, to a full commitment to Jewish ethnicity within Zionism. But we also need to recognize that the non-Jewish Germans are likewise not to be placed into a single category. Erich Kahler, to return to him, put it very well. There were, he said, the alert, cultivated, open-minded, and open-hearted Germans who were self-critical and self-ironical, just like the Jews. I would add, like some Jews. <laughs> but there was also what Kahler called an opposite type of German, in whom German history produced an ineradicable inferiority complex, a persecution complex, who could not overcome a bitterness about Germany's having missed her hegemonial day, the glory of predominance, and who projected the national failure outward at the expense of other peoples." End quote. Given the prejudices anchored in German history, of course they projected that failure outward, especially upon the Jews. If today German political leaders speak frequently of the Jewish cultural loss that needs to be restored, it is because Jewishness and Germanness of the humanistic strain had not remained two separate categories that had become increasingly interwoven over the course of time. In the 1930s, by legislation, and in the November pogrom by violence, the Jewish elements were ripped out of the fabric of the German soul. Today, there is a limited desire, which some believe to be quixotic, to interweave them once again. The history of this cultural relationship between Jews and non-Jews in Germany 
which Erich Koller sought to define in his lecture so many years ago, is yet another, and perhaps the central one of the topics to which the scholarly work of the LBI has been devoted. This area of inquiry, called Beziehungsgeschichte, literally the history of relationship, remains especially difficult because more than the other fields I have listed, subjectivity in this case is so difficult to control. We tend to generalize when we need to individualize. 60 years ago, the Leo Beck Institute with its three branches stood alone the only scholarly institution devoted exclusively to the history of German-speaking Jewry. Today there are others, in Israel and in Europe. Yet the work of understanding German Jewry in its complexity and many-sidedness is far from complete. For the LBI, there remains the task of ever and again giving fresh life to a remarkable historical experience through publication, lecture, and exhibition. For the scholar, there are new and not yet fully exploited tools of research, such as the DigiBeck electronic access to our New York archives. In the course of research, new questions arise new foci emerge, new conceptualizations are put forward and subjected to critical analysis. Thanks in no small measure to the Leo Beck Institute, interest in German-speaking Jewry has remained high over these 60 years. As the pioneer in its field, as the principal repository and transmitter of its written and artistic record here in the New York LBI, and as the publisher of serious scholarship in English, Hebrew, and German, the Leo Beck Institute may look forward to a continuing central role in discerning the fascinating identity of the German Jews, their history, and their heritage. Thank you. Michael is going to stay here for another minute or two. Michael, when Dr. Weitzer several months ago uh, turned to me and he said, in celebration of our 60th anniversary, don't you think that Michael Meyer would be the perfect person to deliver the lecture recounting the history of the Institute my God, how right he was, and we sat in admiration, truly before the depth and breadth of your scholarship. Standing at my side, <clears throat> Joan Lessing, representing the Board of Trustees of the Institute here in New York, as well as a member of the Honors Committee whose chairman, the distinguished Robert Rifkin, is in the audience along with several other of our trustees. And in our audience, how precious, Michael, of you to take note of the presence of Ismar, of Marion, of Michael. Unfortunately, I couldn't mention everyone. <laughs> but their scholarship, along with yours, has contributed immensely to the understanding of a part of Jewish history that needs to be told and understood, told and retold, and you truly are among the great, if not the greatest, who have researched 
and continue to research that history. Moments such as this inevitably evoke reminiscence. It happens to every one of us. There are moments here, there, now and then that suddenly elicit memories from a distant past. Sitting here, Michael, at your feet, listening with such admiration as every one of us did. My thoughts went back to the late 1950s when I, in 1957, left Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania and went to Cincinnati to the Hebrew Union College to study to become a rabbi. I knew already then that I wanted the congregational rabbinate and I'll explain in a moment why that was a very good decision on my part. Three years later, Michael traveled to Cincinnati, but he traveled further. He came from Los Angeles. I studying for the rabbinate, Michael to pursue scholarship. I remember so vividly going into the library Michael was invariably already there. I would sit for five or six hours and have had it. Michael is still there. Little could we have known, little could I have known, that Michael was going to become the brilliant, brilliant scholar and teacher that he became. Less important, could Michael know that I was going to come to New York and become the youngest person ever elected uh, New York Emanuel's senior rabbi? A couple of years later, I was ordained in 62, and Michael took his doctorate in 64. Michael and Margie came to New York, Joni and I were living in a small first floor apartment on the Upper West Side. I suppose that was all lux already luxury compared to Michael and Margie in their apartment on the Grand Concourse in the Bronx. But with our little children, I remember we, we continued a friendship that began in Cincinnati, and although we rarely see each other, maybe once or twice a year, that friendship has endured. Speaking of Cincinnati, in 1948, Nelson Glick became the president of the Hebrew Union College. It was three years after Leo Beck was miraculously liberated from the Theresienstadt concentration camp, and seven years before the founding of the Leo Beck Institute. In 1948, the then new president of the Hebrew Union College, the great archaeologist Nelson Glick, invited Leo Beck to come to Cincinnati as visiting professor. The late Rabbi Albert Friedlander, also a German refugee, who became a Beck disciple and very, did very important work translating a, a great work of, um, of Beck's uh, into English, his title, This People Israel. He recalled, that is Rabbi Friedlander, who was ordained in 1952, before I or Michael came to the campus, recalled walking on a snow-covered ground in Burnett Woods, a beautiful wooded area across the street of, from Clifton Avenue from the campus of the Hebrew Union College. And Rabbi Friedlander recalls that Leo Beck said to him, it's critically important that the grandeur of European Jewry somehow be maintained, preserved, remembered, and integrated into the dynamism 
of American Jewish life. He said it, according to Albert Friedlander, passionately. Michael, so brilliantly, and the Institute, so successfully, has taken that plea of Leo Beck and made it a reality, and we are committed to continue to do so. So, beloved Michael, with Joan Lessing at my side, on behalf of our chairman of the Honors Committee, Robert Rifkin, all of the trustees, the Leo Beck Institute presents the Moses Mendelssohn Award to Professor Michael A. Meyer for his lifelong dedication to teaching and publishing about German Jewish history and culture. We give it to you with our admiration, with our love, and also because of its weight. We will not have you and Margie schlep it back on the plane. We'll send it to you, dear Michael. Mazel tov. I, I will speak only for a moment and say how, how moved I am by this award. Moses Mendelssohn was the very first subject I studied as a graduate student, and I've always had an attachment to him, which I combine with my attachment to Leo Beck, because they had something very important in common. They had a lot in common, but one thing that particularly strikes me that they had in common is their willingness to resist forces that were trying to destroy either the Jewish religion or the Jewish people. In the case of Mendelssohn, because he gained a reputation as a good European, strong efforts were made to get him to leave his Judaism behind and convert to Christianity. And he resisted those efforts and remained an observant Jew his entire life. And Leo Beck, of course, in the 1930s in Germany, with an opportunity to leave Germany and go to a safe country like England or the United States, chose to remain, to resist spiritually as much as was in his power to do the Nazi oppressor. These two great resistors are really models for my life, and I'm very grateful for this award. Yeah, take a picture. Sorry. You had a position. There always has to be a photo op. Thank you, everyone. I hope you'll join us for refreshments and you can ask questions of Michael or anyone. And um, it's uh, been a great pleasure uh, to have you here and to hear the great words of Michael Meyer. So thank you.